Uh, as you're doing that, I'm going to get started. Let me ask you a question to start off today, and it's simply this. What is your life about? So if somebody else that's a friend, somebody else that's around you or their family member, and we were to ask them, like, what is so-and-so's life about? What are they, what's their life focused on? And somebody that's really close to you, what would they say? What is your life about? You know, last week I talked about having a desire for purpose and meaning and how that itself is evidence for a designer. And we talked about that we are made on purpose for a purpose. And today's message is not part of that series, but it really is kind of a continuation of the idea of purpose. And uh, because one of the things we talked about last week is we can each have a different subjective purpose, right? Like, I've been called to be a pastor. I was called into full-time ministry when I was a teenager. Uh, so my entire life has been serving in a full-time, uh, in a full-time role in ministry. And so I've been called to that. And so that's been my, but that's a subjective call. Not everybody else is called to that. Uh, you have a subjective, maybe it's a, you're called to be a teacher. Uh, you're called to be uh, a painter. You're called to be one that uh, maybe you, you're called to adopt, uh, to take somebody else's birth child into your forever home. And you're called to that. But you have, we have different callings subjectively, right? And that, that number of callings can be as many as the different people that are in this room and, in fact, in this world, that we have different subjective callings. Uh, something that I've learned, though, and I understand is, though that's true, there is one objective, same for everyone, who's a Christ follower. There's one objective purpose for every one of us who calls Jesus Lord. Isaiah 43, 7 says, Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. If you're a follower of Christ, you were made, you were created for God's glory. Psalm 115.1 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name goes all the glory for your unfailing love and faithfulness. Or Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do or say. Would you look at your neighbor and say, Whatever you do or say. Or maybe just go, Whatever. <laughs> no. But whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Now, notice that it says what you just said a minute ago, whatever you do, whatever you do or say. As a Jesus follower, this, there isn't an activity, there isn't a time frame in your day that you get to go, time out, like, I'm not doing this as a representative of Jesus. Like this right here, this isn't for God's glory. My, my hobbies, my, the time that I have that's just mine. He said, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative. You know, how would it, how would it change your life if you lived that way? How would it change your driving? Let me just say... I am speaking to myself as well, all right? Because maybe you've never done this. I've been the guy. Like that other person frustrates the snot out of me that is in the lane that's about to end and they're going to accelerate really quickly and try to get in front of you. And maybe you've done this, maybe you haven't, where your foot got a little heavy to make sure that they understood that that was really not a kind thing to do. And so maybe you have a Hemi like I have a Hemi, and you go, you're not getting in. And so you, you speed up, and then they have to get in behind you and then see your follow my family to Bridge Church sticker on the back of your window. <laughs> and then you're like, I'm not sure that was a really good idea. Um, how would it change you if you drove in recognition of God's glory? How about if you played sports in recognition of of God's glory, or if you shopped, ladies, and the day after Thanksgiving, that your primary focus was on the glory of God, and so there's one item left, and you've been waiting, you waited in line for hours, and it's you and one other person, and you went, you go ahead, in recognition of God's glory, or do you go, uh-uh, 
I was here first, <laughs> right? What if you parented in recognition that you're doing this for God's glory? Or what if you watched your children participate in sports <laughs> in recognition of God's glory? By the way, for those who have been around a while, I actually grew in this area this year a lot. Uh, I think I only raised my voice at a referee one time, so that's <laughs> progress. I volunteered to keep the books, to keep the scoreboard, like, all year for home games because it makes you. You have to be good. You can't yell when you're keeping score, so it, it helped. <laughs> what if you neighbored in your neighborhood? What if you were a neighbor in recognition of God's glory? What if you ate at a restaurant even when they got your order wrong? in recognition of God's glory? What if you operated in your job or at school in recognition of God's glory? Would it change the way you live your life? See, when you do that, he receives the glory. Whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 says, We pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. Would he consider it worthy if you live for yourself? I don't think so. Live in such a way that he would consider worthy, for he called you to share in his kingdom and his glory. See, here's the truth. We exist for God's glory. That is our purpose for being. That's the purpose for which God created us. He created us for his glory. John Piper defined God's glory this way. God's glory is the perfect harmony of all of his attributes into one infinitely beautiful and personal being. So when God says that he made us for his glory, he means that he created us to display his glory. That our lives, when lived in a worthy way, that they point people to Jesus and not to ourselves. They point people to Jesus and not to ourselves. In other words, that our life is to be lived all about him and his kingdom, that we were made to build his kingdom, not our kingdom. And he calls us to sacrifice our kingdom on behalf of his. And if you want a purpose that is high enough to live for for the rest of your life, it's this, build his kingdom not yours. Build his kingdom, not yours. Now, if we were to ask you how, would you, how would you evaluate yourself on whose kingdom you have been focused on to this point, I think there's some questions that help us to ascertain that. Number one, where do you invest your time, talent, and treasure? The things that you have, the gifts that you have and possess, your time, where do you, where do you invest those? Are they invested in your kingdom or his kingdom? How about this? What do you think about? What do you dream about? Are your dreams about you and your future? Or do your dreams entail also God's kingdom? Like how he might want to use you in his kingdom. How about this? This is a convicting one. What or who, or we could say it this way, whose kingdom, his or yours, do you talk about more? Those that know you, those that are around you, they say, man, like I know, like God's important to that person because that's what they talk about. Have you ever been in a conversation, you've heard somebody that just talked about themselves? Their hurts, their pains, their needs, their wants, their wishes, their day. But that's what they think about? That's what they focus on? Are you focused on your kingdom or his kingdom? How about this one? This one challenges me. What makes you more sad? When his kingdom takes a hit or when yours does? How about this one? Do your financial dreams include dreaming about what you could give to further God's kingdom to make kingdom impact or are all of your financial dreams about you and your list? Because you have a list. Whether you actually have it written down or not, you have a list. I've got a list. You know, whether it's a new roof or whether it's something fun, you've got a list, some things that when you get the money, you need to spend it, whatever. Does your financial dreams, though, go, man, what would it be like if I could give like that? 
If we looked at your calendar and your spending habits, if you looked at my calendar and my spending habits, it would become clear whose kingdom we're focused on, ours or God's. And if I was to be honest, and hopefully I am, I was, again, called to ministry at 16. I've been preaching the gospel for over 30 years, and there have been multiple times in my life where I got focused on me. How about you? I got focused on me and my kingdom instead of God and his. I got focused on my hobbies. I got focused on my dreams. I got focused on my wishes. As a Christian, what is it that makes your life different from others in your life that aren't Christian? What is it that makes you different? The gospel writer Mark tells a story that happened to Jesus that could very well have been written today. Starting in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says this, As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him. I love that part. Never, I've never noticed that part before, but he, just, he came running up to him, and he knelt down and he asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. Was Jesus said, I'm not really good? Is that what he was saying there? Or, is it, or was he saying, in recognizing that I am good, you're actually saying that I am God? I think that's what he was saying. But to answer the question, he, Jesus says, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. You must honor your father and your mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young and hear this part. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. I love that part. It's like he looked at him and he's like, yeah, you're doing good on this list. But man, I love, there's, there's one thing. And that's where he goes next. He says, there is still one thing that you haven't done. Other translations say, there's one thing that you lack. He said, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Now, what was Jesus' point, I think, in what he told this young man was this. I want you to be focused on building my kingdom and not on your own, Right? You have to understand this. Jesus isn't against the rich. He's not against wealthy people at all. Uh, this particular command isn't for everyone to sell all you have and give away to the poor. It's not, it's not to all of us. And how do we know that? Well, he interacted with other wealthy people in the New Testament. He interacted with lots of other people throughout the New Testaments. He did not give this commandment to anybody else. This was a specific command for this rich young man and so we, we understand that. We know that. Jesus isn't against wealth. He's not against those who have it. But he is against anything that blocks our spiritual connection, that blocks God. In this man's life, it was his wealth. It was blocking what God wanted to do in his life. It was the one thing that was hindering him. Now let me ask you, what is the one thing that you haven't done? What's the one thing you haven't surrendered to God? What is the one thing that you said you can have anything else but this God? What's the one thing that's blocking your connection with God? Because I, I wonder, like, how would, if this specific command, sell all you have, give it away to the poor, if that's not for us today, what could he say to us today that would relate in this area? And I came up with just a few. There, this could be applied in, in thousands of ways, but you've been saving for a vacation, a cruise, or a trip to Disney, none of which is wrong, so don't hear that part of it. Not wrong. Go to Disney, have fun. Go to vacation, have fun. Not the point. This is the point. And God speaks to you. He speaks to you and says, I actually, I want you to go on a missions trip instead of that. Like you hear his voice, you know it's him. I want you to go on a mission strip instead of that. Do you say, yes, Lord? Or do you say, you know, that's a great idea, God. I think I'll do that someday. How about this one? Recreational sports. Some of you may want to punch me after this. Sorry. 
If it applies to you, apply it. If it doesn't, don't. Recreational sports pulling or pulling you and your family out of church. And God speaks. Again, key. Nothing wrong with youth sports. But God speaks to your heart and says, it's actually going to be better for your family to be connected relationally, to be connected in church. And he speaks to you directly and says, I want you to give up that and be connected. Do you say yes or do you say no? Or how about you're, you're a young person, you've got a million followers in social media, you're making videos on YouTube and making more than your parents make in a year. It's reality for a handful of teenagers across the country. But God speaks to you. He's like, this is taking up too much of your time, too much of your focus. I want you focused on me and my kingdom. And God says, I want you to delete your account. Not just I want you to lay it aside. Not just, he actually said, I want you to delete your account. Do you obey or do you excuse? Have you ever excused, like God told you to do something dramatic and you, you kind of ramped it down a little bit? You ratcheted down the sacrifice to something that was more tolerable? And so you didn't say yes, but you didn't exactly say no. You said, let me adjust your demands, God. There have been two times in my life, and I've told this story before, but it's been a while and it applies here, but there's been two times in my life when, when golf became kind of too important. Uh, for me, that, that's my favorite hobby, and so it became too important, and I was thinking about it, and uh, it had kind of my heart and had my mind as far as just too focused on it. And in, in these two different instances, separated by years, uh, I felt like God told me, like, I want you to lay that aside. I want you to give that up. And I did, both times. I did for a season, for a time, until I felt like God said, you can pick it back up again. Because you, I picked it back up with balance. I picked it back up where it wasn't consuming me. I picked it back up where it was just a hobby. And I could pick it back up again. See, this rich young ruler was defined. He was defined by the things he owned, but he was also defined by the things that he didn't do. Uh, Jesus told him to know the commandments. And he went, I haven't committed adultery. I haven't testified falsely. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't cheated anyone. I haven't stolen from anyone. I, ha I honor my, my parents. And so Jesus is, is saying, you know, to do all these things. And the man goes, check, check, check. He's like, I'm good. But then he was still sensing like something's still missing. The reality is God wants us to be better than good. He wants us to be obedient. And he wants us to be focused on building his kingdom, not ours. This idea fits into our theme for 2018, which is multiply. Uh, multiplication happens, growth happens in our lives when we focus on his kingdom instead of ours. But when we live and exist to build our own life, to build our own kingdom, can I tell you this? It doesn't do much for God's kingdom. When you're focused on you and your kingdom, it doesn't do much for his and his kingdom. Can I also t let you in on a secret? If you're focused on you and your kingdom, it doesn't do much for you. It doesn't bless your life by focusing on your life. It doesn't do much for yours. When we're focused on ourselves, it doesn't lead ultimately to our happiness or to our health. Uh, in a Psychology Today article, not a Christian publication, uh, Dr. Leon Seitzer said this. What's most fascinating to me here is that I haven't seen discussed by writers on the subject, he's talking about self-focus or self-absorption, I haven't seen discussed by writers on the subject just how many psychological dysfunctions can be accurately understood as maladies of self-absorption. From a variety of phobic, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive impairments to many depressive disturbances, to various addictions, to post-traumatic stress disorder, and to most of the personality disorders, self-absorption can be seen as playing a major, if not dominant, role. So any effective treatment of these dysfunctions needs to include significantly reducing these obsessively self-centered and self-defeating tendencies, end quote. What's he saying? Focusing on you 
does not lead to a happier, healthier you. Uh, in fact, to be healthier doesn't mean you have to think less of yourself. doesn't mean, like, I'm a worm. You know, it doesn't th- mean you think less of yourself. It actually means you think of yourself less. Like your daily focus isn't on you. It isn't on what you're lacking. It isn't on what you're missing. It isn't on what you have. It's on others. It's on God. It's on his kingdom instead of being on you and yours. The rich young ruler was doing good. I mean, he was living the dream. He had season tickets to the Colosseum, right? He had a Lexus chariot. He had a team of employees at his tunic factory. He had a membership at the Sea of Galilee Yacht Club. I mean, he was living it. He was living the dream. But in all of his success, he recognized, like, I'm missing something. He was a who's who in Jerusalem, and he goes, I've reached the top, and I recognize that there's still something missing. I recognize it's, it's not all that it was cracked up to be. Have you ever heard a celebrity say that or a superstar athlete say that? You wonder why so many that have everything are hooked on drugs, they're hooked on power, they're hooked on sex in some other way that just destroys their life. You're like, you have everything. Why are you letting this thing distract you? Can I tell you? It's because they're still sensing they're missing something. In all the success, he needed to know how to be good with God. And when he said that to Jesus, I love the fact Jesus didn't hold back. He told him the whole unvarnished truth. He said, you still lack one thing. There's one thing you haven't done yet. Now, I have a... A little illustration here that I want to show you. I have here some elements. I have a a bowl. This bowl represents uh, this represents you. This is your life. This represents your one thing. The platter does, and then the water represents God's favor that He wants to pour on you. And so here's what happens a lot of times is our one thing is in place. It's blocking what God wants to do in our life. And God comes along and says, I have some blessing I want to pour out in your life. And we're like, I'm just not receiving any blessing from God. I don't understand what's going on. And God says, I have the, you have this one thing. And it's blocking what I want to do in your life. And so you say, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to take the lid off, right? And then God says, I have this blessing I want to pour out in your life. And all of a sudden, it's like, I feel it. I've experienced this blessing. What, why is that? Because you've removed the one thing. You've taken off the lid and you said, God, I want, what, I want what you want for my life. Instead of being focused on, I'm, no, I'm, I'm about me and my life. I want to hold it all together. I want to keep it all the way it is. Instead of that, we're... We, we live more with open hands instead of clinging on to and holding on to the thing that we think is important. Instead, we take our hands off and we say, it's yours, God. And we live open and we allow, right, by removing that lid, we allow God's favor to actually begin to pour into us. One of the ways that God teaches us this lesson is in, is in the area of tithing. And it's not because God goes, you know what? I need your money. That's not the reason. The reason is he actually wants something for you. And he recognizes that when we put his kingdom first financially, it does something for our life. It takes the lid off. In fact, that's even the way that the, the, that picture is described to us in, in Scripture. He says, test me in this and see if I will not pour out the blessings of heaven. See if I will not open the windows of heaven on you in your life. He doesn't promise that you're going to get rich from it. He promises that his blessing is going to pour out in your life. When we take off the lid. And we take off the lid by being what? Obedient. That's the calling for God is just to be obedient. See, I want you to notice the rich young man's response. It says, at this... When Jesus asked him to do something and he didn't do it, it says, at this, the man's face fell 
and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a risk of, of sounding like a heretic for a second. So hang on with me. Don't leave during this part. Let me finish my statement. Everybody said, okay? All right. I think the scripture is wrong a little bit. Let me, let me read it to you the way that I think will make more sense to you. And I think is what he's saying. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for his many possessions had him. His many possessions had him. It wasn't a matter that he had stuff. I've met lots of people that had stuff, but their stuff didn't have them. They were able to bless other people with it. They were able to, you know, they, they used it for other people. But have you ever met somebody that their stuff had them? The man said, I can't do that. Or maybe more aptly, he said, I will not do that. And again, this is, it goes back to the question for me. Do you think God, did he need the money? Was there something on God's wish list that he couldn't afford, and so he needed this rich man to, you know, help a little brother out? Did, did he, uh, you know, Jesus had his eye on something that he couldn't afford? No, it goes back to this. He didn't want something from him. He wanted something for him. And he recognized that this man's finances were, were putting a lid on, his, on God's ability to pour out blessing in his life. His commitment and his focus on him and his kingdom was holding this guy back. And notice when Jesus said, he said, go and sell everything you have and give it to me. That's not what he said. He didn't say, go and sell everything you have and give it to the temple. He said, go and sell your, everything you have and then just go give it to poor people. That's what he said. He wasn't getting anything out of this personally, right? It wasn't something for Jesus. It wasn't something for God. It was something for that man. He's like, this is the one thing that's holding you back. And so when God asks us to do something hard, something that requires sacrifice, something that is focused on the needs of others instead of ourselves, there is freedom and joy for those who step into their yes. There is freedom and there is joy, unlike anything that we can experience in any other way, when we simply step into the yes of what God's asking us to do, when we say yes. We step out of our mess into his yes. I just made that up. I thought it sounded cool. But when we do that, we experience freedom and we experience joy. When we say no, Lord, one, one that's an oxymoron. Lord, Lord means your master, controller, ruler. Can't really say no, Lord. But anyway, when we do that, and we all do that at different times, but when we say no, Lord, I believe we experience the same emotion as the rich young man did. We experience sadness. We experience sadness in our soul, in our heart, because we recognize that we just said no to God. See, I don't think we can experience true joy when we're walking in disobedience. When God has said, here's the, here's the step, here's the yes, and we say no, we can't really experience true joy. But when we live focused on blessing others, there's a promise for us in God's word, uh, many of them. But one of them is Proverbs 11:25, 25, and the Passion Translation says it this way. Those who live to bless others will have blessings heaped upon them. And the one who pours out his life to pour out blessings will be saturated with favor. See, for joy and purpose to be maximized in your life is, is simply that requirement of let him... You know, take off, take off the lid and let obedience, and you focus on others instead of your own kingdom. You focus on God and his, and it says your life will be saturated, saturated with favor, saturated with blessing. And I just wonder, why is the greatest level of freedom and satisfaction and joy found in doing this, found in focusing on others? And I think it's this, because it's why we exist. We exist for God's glory. We don't exist to build our own kingdom. We don't exist so we, he who ends with the most toys wins. Right? We exist for God's glory. We exist for his purposes and not for ours. 
1 Thessalonians 2.12 again says, live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. Again, focused on others, focused on him, not on ourselves, in a way that God would consider worthy for he called you to share. He called you to share in his kingdom. He called you to share in his glory. That is an amazing promise. And when we're focused on God's kingdom, we find incredible joy. We find incredible purpose in serving, in giving, in celebrating, in worshiping, in uh, lifting up the name of Jesus, in inviting someone else to just come and see, come and see what God is doing, come and see. And it's an amazing feeling. If you've ever been a part of it, when you have, and maybe it was an invitation, you invited somebody to come to church with you, and they came, and they connected with Christ, and then you, be, you began to see like God transform their lives. And you began to see maybe it start to leak into their family. And it was transforming an entire family. And you went, like, I did that. No, you didn't. You got to partner with God, though. You got to be part of it. Because if you hadn't said yes to God, I'll do that, then maybe they wouldn't have been invited. And maybe God wouldn't have had the opportunity then. They wouldn't have been in the place where the miracle happened in their life. But what an amazing experience when we partner with God, right? When we say yes and we do something and, and he does the miraculous. You know, I think that's, that's true of us as individuals, but how much is that also true of us as a church? Um, God doesn't want Bridge Church to exist for the purpose of Bridge Church. And we don't. He doesn't want us to exist for us or for our glory we're not, we're not planting a campus of Bridge Church in Oconomowoc to expand our brand, to make us famous, to make the church bigger for numbers' sake. Our prayer is that it would get bigger, but it would be bigger for his glory because numbers represent people. And so we want to see more people connect with God and with others. So we're planting another campus for his glory so that we can be partners with God in expanding his kingdom for his glory, so that we can be used to see individuals and families begin to be transformed for his glory, so that we can see people step into purpose and meaning and begin serving for his glory, so that we can reach more people faster for his glory. And here's the truth I've discovered when it comes to certain advances to his church and for his church, is God wants us participating, not spectating. He wants us participating, not spectating. You know, that he wants us to partner with him. Uh, and we could say it this way. Without God, we cannot. And without us, God will not. There are some things. He's not limited by us, but he does invite us to partner with him. And so there are certain things that he wants our participation in. And here's the thing. God isn't looking for superstars to expand his kingdom. He's not looking for the the spiritual LeBron James that can carry the whole kingdom on his back and do it all himself, or come close. As long as somebody doesn't get a rebound and throw it back out. Never, never mind. <laughs> but he's not looking for that level of superstars in his kingdom. He's looking for ordinary, normal people who simply say yes. Right? I think he looks at every single one of us and says, who has something that I can use for my glory? Who has something that they're willing to give for my glory? Who is willing to serve for my glory? Who is willing to go to school in your everyday life for my glory? Who is willing to go on the job site every single day but do it for my glory? Who is willing to parent your children for my glory? Who is willing to be married to your spouse and to treat them in such a way that is for my glory? Who will build my kingdom, not theirs? All for my glory. And this morning as I was praying and I was getting ready, I had another... Bible story that popped in my head, and I don't have time to share the whole story, but most of you will have heard of it, and for those of you that haven't, there was a day when Jesus is preaching, and there's thousands of people present. The Bible doesn't tell us how many people. It just simply tells us how many men 
but we also know there were women and children there. So most scholars believe it was somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people were there. And there was a little boy who had a lunch that the disciples, as they're looking, they're trying to figure out how do we feed so many people, you know, because nobody brought lunch with them. Uh, the subway was closed on the corner and whatever, you know, the cavelta fish wasn't biting. I don't know. There wasn't any food. And so one of the disciples, Andrew, brought the little boy to Jesus and he had his lunch. And when I thought about that story this morning, I thought, who went home happier that day? Was it the thousands of people who got to see a miracle? They got to eat one. Or was it the little boy who brought his lunch to Jesus? He wasn't focused on himself, was he? Because the only way he had to assure that he was going to get to eat was if he ate his own lunch. I mean, he brought it. It's not his fault. All these other people were unprepared for the day. He packed his, he packed his turkey sandwich and his ding-dongs and his package of chips, and he was ready for the day. But these other people, they didn't do it. And so now you want me to give up my lunch? I don't think so. No, he didn't do that. He simply he stepped into his yes. Who do you think went home happier that day? Now, everybody went home happy. They got their belly filled. They were excited that, I mean, they got to see this little boy's lunch turn into the, the feeding of thousands and thousands of people. I mean, that's pretty cool. But this little boy had a story that he got to tell for the rest, for the rest of his life. I remember a day with thousands of people when I gave my two fish and five loaves, whatever it was, when I gave it to Jesus, and he prayed, and he began giving it to his disciples to pass out, and they literally just kept giving out food. And somehow that one lunch for me turned into feeding thousands of people. Do you think he lived the rest of his life for his kingdom? Or do you think he lived the rest of his life for God's kingdom? I fully believe. We don't know this from Scripture, so I can't say this is gospel truth, but I fully believe this little boy learned at a young age that God could do more with his lunch than he could ever do with it. And so he learned to say yes. He learned that when he said yes, God wanted something not from him. God didn't need his lunch. Right? He didn't need his lunch. He who created every single person that ever lived, every single animal that ever lived, God could have, God could have pulled up a Whataburger right there. I know that you don't know what that restaurant is. That's a southern thing. But he could have pulled up a restaurant, Culver's, popped it right up a couple thousand years early. They could have had Butterburgers on the shore. It would have been awesome. He could have done that. He's not limited, omniscient omnipotent. There is no limitation to his powers. So he did not need this little boy's lunch to feed the people, but he wanted it because he wanted a participant. He wanted a partner with him. He didn't just want a, a spectator from the outside seeing what God did. He wanted people that stepped into it, that stepped out of the mess into their, into their yes and that said, yes, God. And he wanted it because he wanted it for the boy. And he wants it for you and he wants it for me that we're not spectator Christians, but that we're participants with God. What a difference it will make in your life and in the lives of those around you if we remember that we exist for God's glory. If we remember that we are to build his kingdom, not ours. And if you do that, your children will be blessed. They'll be blessed more by you stepping into a yes and being obedient than by passing on millions of dollars to them when you die. They would be blessed more if you were penniless, but you said yes to Jesus when he called. God wants something for you, not from you. Would you